I think it's about time we can get this rocking and rolling. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Happy Thursday. I want to welcome you to viral protein characterization by peptide mapping. So I'm going to tell you, you are in for a treat. We've decided to kind of give you a BOGO deal um, and actually do an overview of intact over intact mass analysis as well. So we're going to give you those two. We'll cover peptide mapping as well as intact mass analysis. And I would like to introduce you to your tour guide today. Uh, Dilip Reddy Candela is a staff application scientist here at SciEx. He acquired his master's in pharmaceutical chemistry from Manipal University in India. And since then, he has over 10 years of experience as a research scientist in pharma and biopharma industries using LCMS-based workflows for the quantitation of small molecules for DMPK analysis, as well as novel and biosimilar characterization. He, very lucky for us, has been with SciEx for a bit over five years, and I'm very proud. He was also just recently promoted. And at SciEx, he and his team perform product demonstrations for biopharma applications. So, Dilip, thank you very much for joining us today. How are you? I'm good, Paula. Thank you so much for a nice introduction. Uh, how are you doing? <laughs> You're welcome. I'm I'm very well today. Thank you. Weather's a bit gloomy, but we got to get yeah. over these things somehow. Yeah. Uh, let's begin with the uh, intact uh, protein uh, molecular weight determination using uh, uh, Sykes Genote of 7600 instrument. So here you could see uh, the high-level schematic of the uh, intact mass mass determination workflow for capsid protein characterization. So let if we if we talk about the sample preparation uh, for intact mass analysis, sample preparation is very fast. Uh, what it involves is like a first step is a denaturation uh, to break apart the capsid, and then what I would suggest is a, a buffer exchange so that we can remove the buffer that will not interfere with the annihilation on the mass spec. So, but in general, we have uh, implemented the uh, LC approach uh, with the high uh, with analytical flow. Uh, connected with the uh, Zenote of 7600 system to acquire the data sets. And once we acquire the data sets, uh, we have processed them using a, using a software uh, called Biologics Explorer. Uh, at this point, uh, I would like to uh, switch to a Sax OS software to demonstrate how easy to set up the method for determination of the molecular weight of the AV8 capsid protein. So this is the home screen of the SACS OS software. It's very intuitive. Uh, even uh, very uh, beginner or uh, uh, new user, uh, they can easily navigate to the software. For example, if you want to make a new method or if you want to open the existing method, I will just go here in the MS method, workspace style. I'll just click on this one so that we will be able to open the window for the MS method. So if you want to make a new method, we can just click here. So there is an option of different uh, scan function. Generally, uh, for intact mass, we use a TOF MS. And for peptide mapping workflows, we use IDA. IDA is called as information dependent acquisition. It's another term of data dependent acquisition. So uh, I have already uh, saved a method for intact and peptide mapping both the workflows. Let's review the data and discuss about some parameters, how they uh, affect for uh, acquiring a high quality data. So I'm opening the intact mass method that we have used for acquiring this particular data sets. So if you take a look at this uh, method pane, uh, so in this Sykes OS software, we have implemented a new feature here. We can choose the workflow that, uh, what kind of samples that you are going to acquire using uh, this particular workflow. For example, if you select the intact mass, intact protein, or if you select the peptide map, peptides or glycopeptides, a small molecule based on the samples that you're going to run on the on this system, some of the parameters will be automatically adjusted that are very critical for acquiring the uh, good quality data. So not all the parameters, some of them are automatically adjusted, and then uh, you can go ahead and acquire some data here. And uh, here you could see source and gas parameters. These are the parameters also called as flow dependent parameters. So what is the flow that we are sending to the mass spec? Based on the flow rate, these parameters will be optimized. For example, if the flow rate is very high, these parameters will be optimized a little higher side. If the flow rate is very low, or maybe 100 microliter or 200 microliter, the, these parameters will be optimized slightly lower side. The main purpose of these parameters is to uh, completely uh, and efficiently 
evaporate or dissolve the mobile phase that is being entered into the source of the mass spec. One more point is like once you optimize these uh, uh, source and gas parameters for particular uh, flow rate, for example, you have optimized these parameters for 0.25 mils per minute. So if in the future, if you are acquiring the any any other uh, protein or any other sample with a similar flow rate, you can use the same parameters. We don't have to optimize for each and every different sample that is being analyzed at the same flow rate. And that is one of the advantage. And uh, the, the second part is uh, TOF MS. As I mentioned earlier, since it's a TOF MS uh, determination, like intact molecular weight determination of the protein, we just use TOF MS. In the TOF MS, basically we define the, what is the range of the uh, start and stop mass range. Basically these values also again, uh, will vary based on, based on the size of the protein. If the size of the protein is bigger, it will be uh, the range will be slightly higher. And if the size of the protein is smaller, the range will be smaller. The, the purpose is to accommodate the charge envelope that is being uh, generated uh, for the protein. So once you set all these parameters, you can use, uh, these, these are kind of uh, generic parameters. You can use uh, same parameters for uh, acquiring most of the uh, proteins intact mass determination, right? But the only thing we need to consider or critical to be changed based on the size of the protein is mass range. And apart from these two values, we may have to change the declustering potential and time means some also. So basically how it works, these two parameters are based on the size of the protein. With the bigger size of the bigger size protein, we'll have the higher number. For example, uh, this will be 250, for a monoclonal antibody. Since this AAV capsids are uh, higher, uh, VP1 is 80 kilo Dalton. So this has been optimized on 150. And time bins to some will be like 120, uh, maybe 150 for uh, monoclonal antibodies. Since this protein is slightly uh, lower than half of the mo monoclonal antibody. So we are using 100, it, it has been optimized. So uh, as I mentioned uh, here, uh, these parameters once we optimize can be used for most of the proteins for uh, acquisition of the intact molecular weight. So this is about the uh, intact mass method, how we can make using the Sykes-Way software. And then let's take a look at the LC method. So again, if you want to make LC method or if you want to see the or open the existing LC method, we'll just go here, LC method, and open the LC method that we have already saved for acquiring this particular data. It's very similar uh, like any LC, uh, standalone LC or any other LC method how we define here. We need to define the gradient program that we are uh, going to use for acquisition and the flow rate, what is the pressure, all the information we can define here. And uh, critically, uh, critical point is, is when you are acquiring the protein uh, intact molecular weight, the column moment temperature most of the times we, we will use 80 degrees centigrade. So for this particular analysis, we have used a formic acid buffer system, like mobile phase A is 0.1% formic acid in astronitrile, mobile phase B is 0.1% formic acid in uh, astronitrile, sorry, the water and the astronitrile. And then uh, column, we have used C8, C8 column for the separation of the VP proteins. So with this method, we have acquired data for two samples. One sample is uh, VP proteins are assembled in, uh, uh, in cell system HEC293, which is human cell line. And another sample is uh, VP proteins are assembled in uh, insect cell line, SF9. So to the main purpose of this uh, acquiring uh, two different cell systems is to understand what are the differences between these two cell systems when we use for um, assembling the VP proteins here. So with this uh, methods, we have acquired some uh, data and uh, processed with Biologics Explorer software. So let's uh, go to the Biologics, Biologics Explorer software to see uh, how we have processed and how the data output looks like. So this is a biological ex uh, biologics explorer software. Uh, it's a dedicated tool for uh, uh, characterization of proteins. So it has got all the workflows, uh, intact and subunit peptide mapping, all the workflows we can use for uh, data processing and uh, reviewing the data. So this software has all uh, readily, readily available templates for uh, all the workflows. So user just has to open the data file here. And if you just hit the play uh, button here, so all the steps automatically will be processed and we'll be able to see the, review the data at this step. 
uh, apart from this loading the sample user may have to define the protein sequence and what are the modifications that are expected uh, at this particular protein mapping step right so once we define these values uh, sequence and uh, the additional modifications that are expected we can review the data at this particular step so this is the reconstructed data you can see here how it looks and uh, you can see the phospho and acetylation and phosph uh, acetylation plus phosphorylation all the modifications and again you can see the vp3 here so non acetylated and acetylated so there is an option you can uh, label the peaks as well here It has got all kind of uh, features that will be required for uh, data comparison and between the uh, different uh, uh, set, like different samples, if you want to compare all the features it has got, modification. So when you add the modifications, it will suggest like what is the protein and VP3 plus acetylation. So this is about how it looks. Uh, for the time's sake, uh, I have uh, copied some of the data into the PowerPoint uh, so that we can easily review in the PowerPoint. So let's uh, take a, uh, quick look at the PowerPoint to see how the what is what are the differences between the two cell lines HEC293 and SF9. So one of the important feature I would like to mention here in the intact mass workflow of the Biologics Explorer is when you open the data, so we have the nice feature here. So these are you can you can select the particular range. This is the peak of the VP3 and this is the peak of VP2 and this is the peak of VP1. So there is a nice feature, visualization feature here. It's a 3D visualization here. So it, it is the MORZ retention time and intensity. It provides nice 3D overview. So it will help to better visualization. User can understand what are the additional impurities that are present in the sample apart from the uh, protein of interest. So it has some, uh, some nice uh, visualization features uh, and easy to use software. One, so let's take a look at the uh, differences between the Two different cell systems that we have acquired using this uh, particular workflow. So here you could see uh, a TACF of one of the sample uh, where we could we could get the decent separation between the all three VP proteins. And uh, in the bottom pins, you can see uh, the top MS spectrum of VP1 and VP2 and VP3. Then we could see the uh, strong uh, top MS signal uh, for all the three VP proteins. And in this slide, as I mentioned earlier, two different cell line uh, assembled proteins we have been we have analyzed. On the top pin, this is X293 cell line, and this is SF9 cell line. And VP1, VP2, VP3, this is the reconstructed molecular weight. And uh, the main purpose of this study was to uh, answer the question like, is there any differences between the HEC293 and SF9? Yes, looking at this data, we can say VP1 and VP2, relative percent of modification, are higher in SF9 over H293 cell line. And also, uh, if you take a look at the VP3, VP3 is more completely acetylated in H293 compared to the SF9. In the case of SF9, we are looking at, uh, we are able to see uh, non acetylated VP3 also. That, so here we try to demonstrate the simple workflow with a formic acid buffer system and using a SAX of 7600 system to acquire a good quality data in order to see the differences between the modifications at intact level. So yeah, at this point, I would like to take a quick pause to see if you have any questions. All right, Dilip, we are we're ready for, for a question break. Um, before we get started, I do just want to remind everybody, feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. We should have one more opportunity uh, to ask your questions of Dilip live. So please, again, feel free to, to submit any questions that you do have. So we will get started. Let me pull them over. All right, Dilip, first question for you is, what is the recommended on-column protein load for intact mass determination of AAVs? 
it's it's not only for AAVs on this particular system. Based on our experience, the recommended on column load is the right from 500 nanogram to one microgram. You will get the high quality uh, top MS spectrum. For this particular study, we have uh, injected uh, one microgram on column. So you could see even a very low, low abundant BP1 also, we could see the very strong signal. So for particularly this AAV8, I would say one microgram should be good enough to get the good, nice data. Okay. Yeah. All right, next question. Uh, formic acid buffer system, can it separate all of the BP proteins? Yeah, one thing I would like to highlight here, like there are uh, some challenges uh, in uh, this particular AAV8 uh, analysis at intact level. One is uh, limited sample uh, quantity availability. And second one is uh, all these three VP proteins are share very similar sequence that leads to uh, physical chemical properties are very uh, similar, highly similar. So because of that reason, separation is a little bit complex. Generally, to address these challenges, what we what we can do is we can use uh, uh, ion pairing agents like difluorastic acid or, or trifluorastic acid. One advantage with those uh, buffer systems are we can get the better separation. At the same time, they are not uh, mass spec friendly, right? So more frequently, we have to clean the source or maybe we have to clean the LC systems in order to get rid of the, maybe there is a chance of adduct formation also if we use those. And also we may lose the uh, intensity, signal intensity also. So just to, uh, in this study, what we, we have focused is, uh, is there any way we can get the good data by avoiding the ion pairing agents? So looking at this data, even with the formic acid also, we can get the decent separation between all the three uh, VP proteins. And also we can get the good signal. And there is a no possibility of adduct formation. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And maybe something uh, I would like to share one more thing. We we are thinking to implement one more uh, mobile phase system. Maybe mm -hmm. we can add 50-50, uh, like 0.05% of difluorastic acid, 0.05% of formic acid, so that there will be like better separation and better signal. So that, that is something we are thinking to do okay. in the lab. Yeah. But the, the data that you're sharing with us today, that was a formic acid system. It's just formic acid, yeah. Awesome. Okay. All right, uh, next question. The Biologics Explorer looks very much like gene data expressionist. Very good eye there, Jill. Yeah. Uh, is this connected with gene data? Does the software require an annual subscription model like gene data does? Do you want me to do that one, Dilip? Yeah, please, yeah, please yeah? go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So like I said, good eye, Jillian. Um, yes, so this is um, kind of a branch of, of gene data, but it is SciX's software. <laughs> So rather than the puzzle pieces of gene data, we have templated the workflows for you. Um, but it does work off of an annual subscription model, just like Expressionist does. So not as much of the um, building the workflows specifically for you. We've got it already templated for you. So you can kind of just press play and, and rock and roll with it. So let's do maybe two more questions I think we've got time for. So um can you do batch analysis with this software? Yes, yes. Uh, this Biologics Explorer, as I mentioned, like it has got all the workflows intact, factor mapping, submit analysis. All the workflows has a capability. We can submit multiple samples in a batch and we can uh, compare between the samples or between the batches of the samples. Okay. The only thing uh, when we are select selecting the sample at the first step, we have to do the multiple sample selection. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's do one more. Um, this says, I'm used to seeing peak height on the Y axis. What, or axis, excuse me. What is the 100% representative of? 100% is the, like, it, it considers the highest peak, which is the, uh, the, for example, if you have three different peaks in the spectrum or a deconvoluted spectrum, the 100% is uh, the highest peak is the 100%. And do you know, is it is it peak intensity? Is it peak height? It's percentage. Per Right, uh, but yeah. is it the peak height that it's percentage of? Peak height, peak height, okay. yes, peak height, yeah. Okay. All right, so I think we've we've got a couple of other questions, but I think for now, just so that we can make sure we get through everything, Dilip, why don't we give it on back to you, and we'll move on to the peptide mapping workflows. Sure.
Cool. So as we saw the intact mass uh, determination, how easy it was on using a SAX unit of 7600 with the uh, analytical flow range. Let's take a look at uh, peptide mapping workflow, how we can uh, generate some good data using uh, the, uh, the analytical flow with the SAX unit of 7600, right? So let's talk about the sample prep here. Here's a sample prep. Again, uh, first step is a denaturation uh, to uh, uh, to break apart the capsid and then uh, reduction uh, to to break the sulfide disulfide bonds if there are any. And uh, next step is the alkylation. Alkylation is to prevent the reformation of the disulfide bonds. And followed by alkylation, we have the triptych digestion. Right. Uh, once uh, we generate the sample, digested sample, we have uh, acquired the data set. So using a uh, 7600 system, uh, two different sets we have acquired. One is CID, traditional CID fragmentation, and uh, the alternative fragmentation is uh, electron-based fragmentation, it's EED, uh, which is uh, recently introduced technology in this uh, 7600 system. And the data sets again uh, processed using the uh, Biologics Explorer software. So at this point, uh, let's go to the sci -X software to see uh, how, how we can make the uh, MS and LC methods for uh, the peptide mapping workflow. So again, similarly, we, we will go to the MS method workspace style, and uh, I, we have some saved method here. Let's open the saved method for the peptide mapping. For this workflow, uh, for the we have selected glycopeptide so that some of the parameters will be automatically adjusted. The main parameters that are that will be adjusted is accumulation time and the mass range that that are being uh, used for acquiring the data. So here again, you can you can see here the source and gas parameters. They are very similar, right? Based, uh, these are uh, th these. If you are using the same flow rate like that you have used for the intact mass, you can use the same parameters. If you are slightly changing the flow rate, again, these can be slightly optimized for complete or uh, evaporation of the mobile phase. So in this, you can, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is called IDA, Information Dependent Acquisition or DDA, right? So this will have two experiments. One is TOF MS experiment, followed by TOF MS MS ex experiment here. In the top MS experiment, we will define the mass range so that all the peptides in this uh, sample, what we are injecting to the mass spec, will be captured uh, precursor mass in this range, right? Once we get, once we capture the precursor of the peptide, and then we have defined IDA criteria here. What is IDA criteria is? IDA criteria is, uh, we will define maximum candidate ions 10, an intensity threshold exists 100 counts, 100 counts per second, right? Any peptide in this range, what we have defined in top MS that has been captured and that meets the criteria of 100 counts per second, right? That will automatically trigger for MSMS -MS fragmentation, okay? So, under MSMS -MS fragment, what we want to acquire, like the full MSMS -MS spectrum that we want to capture for each of the peptide from the sample, we are defining the range for that MSMS -MS spectrum, 100 to 2000, right? So by doing this method, we are uh, going to acquire MS and MSMS -MS information for all of the peptides that are present in the sample, correct? So this is about the peptide mapping method generally how we use. So here you could see like, I would like to briefly uh, provide some information about uh, two technology features that have been introduced in this uh, SAX Xenote of 7600 system. So one is xenopulsing. The main purpose of this xenopulsing is to solve the sensitivity gap, right? So what it does is the xenopulsing uh, carefully control the release of, uh, release of ions from the collision cell to the accelerator of the top tube. So by doing this careful control, all ions, that all MSMS fragments that are being generated in the collision cell will arrive at the same time, at the same location in the accelerator, so that subsequent pulsing will push all the ions into the top tube, so that there won't be any loss of the ions 
because of non synchronization between the pulsing and releasing so which is normal with the qt of based instruments that's why generally in the qt of based instruments the duty cycle is only 5 to 25% right in this case because of this careful control we are improving the uh, we are improving the uh, duty cycle by more than 90% so what we will get by implementing this technology uh the tech with this technology will provide you the signal uh, intensity of msms msms signal will be 5 to 10 times more compared to the top ms signal so basically this is very important for uh, confirmation of the low abundant modifications with the msms signal right this is the one of the technology that has been introduced in the 7600 another one is if you notice here we have used uh, for this particular uh, fragmentation is a traditional cad as i mentioned uh, before we have introduced one alternative fragmentation in this system that is called a ead electron activated dissociation so in order to get the ead let's go here to activate the ead show ead parameters so as soon as you check that box we will be able to get the drop down list here and then we can select the ead fragmentation right so once we select this ead fragmentation and uh, basically what basically the, what is the difference between the cad and ead cad will generate b and y fragments of the peptides ead will generate c and z fragments of the peptides so these are very important for confirmation of the labile modification such as glycosylation phosphorylation and sulfation also this ead will help to uh, different uh, help to differentiate the isomers by generating the diagnostic fragments so we we'll, we are going to see some of the examples how ead will help to differentiate the isomers in particular uh, data that we have generated so with these two different methods one is ead method and another one is cad fragmentation method we have acquired uh, two different sets uh, data sets to compare the differences between the cad and ead and to confirm the sequence coverage and modifications and also the difference between the isomers as well so let's uh, take a look at the data processing in the biologics explorer yeah so this is a peptide mapping workflow of biologics explorer how it looks it is very similar as we observed in the intact mass workflow right we need to load the sample here and in the second step it will uh, uh, allow us to define the retention time range what is the retention time that you want to process or you want to process the entire chromatogram so that will that will be uh, controlled at this step and then data preparation so it will be some noise uh, noise reduction chemical subtraction all the stuff will be done under data preparation and at this step you will be able to define the sequence information what is the tolerance what is the digestion enzyme you used what are the alkyl alkylating agent for example if you are performing non reduced peptide mapping for disulfide bond mapping all those information can be defined here and once you define that information right we will be able to process the data and you can review here review the data under this uh, section so this is how it looks after processing the data now you can see a nice data visualization of the sequence right uh, there is a like a color annotation for each different modification for example if you want to see what is the location of the phosphorylation quickly at the uh, from the entire sequence here so you can see these are the two serines that are phosphorylated right the different different color has been annotated and you can see the coverage also here what is the coverage full sequence coverage what we got with this we could get 94.7% sequence coverage and also software provides you the modification table it will provide provide all the information and exact site of modification where uh, local what is the exact amino acid number that has been modified and one more thing to highlight here it's uh, this sequence uh, information that we are able to visualize here and this peptide table are uh, interactive whenever you want to see particular peptide you can highlight in the table so that it will be highlighted in the sequence also and you will be able to see the msms spectrum and the sequence information 
and uh, what are the fragments that will be covered by the MSMS information here. So this is about uh, uh, the Biologic Explorer, how it can be processed for peptide mapping data sets, right? And also if we have, it will pro provide the quantities, entire list of all the modifications, right? You can see the relative, relative percentage of all the modifications that are present in the sample, the exact site of modification, right? And also you'll be able to get the summary also. And the summary, you will have all the information. What are the parameters that have been used for processing this dat particular data? And what, are the, what is the sequence that have been used? Miscleavages on which is the enzyme used? All the information you'll be able to, what are the modifications? Every information you'll be able to see here, right? Yeah, so again here, I have copied some of the uh, representative examples for each modification into the PowerPoint to understand the power of the CAD and EAD. MSMS fragmentation for particular AAV8 protein characterization. Right? So let's take a look at the data here. Yeah, as as we as we saw in the software, this is the sequence coverage we got from. Uh, uh, it is sequence coverage is same for both, whether it is CAD or EAD. We we get uh, the similar coverage. It's not the like, cumulative coverage. Independently, CAD is 94.7, EAD also is 94.7, right? As we, observe, as we saw in the intact mass, VP3, VP1 and VP3 are both are acetylated. So the same has been confirmed at the peptide level also. We could get the strong MSMS confirmation for VP1 acetylation. You can see this is highlighted. That means it's the term acetylation of the VP1. And also you could see the Signal, a strong MSMS signal for entum acetylation of the VP3 protein, right? Uh, if you remember, like uh, we have, we observed some of the non-acetylated uh, signal also in the intact for SF9 sample, we can see the MSMS spectrum for non-acetylated uh, species also at the peptide level, right? This is one of the confirmation of the entum acetylations. Similarly, uh, we could get the very good MSMS confirmation for both uh, serine uh, phosphorylated, right? One is at uh, this site and one is at here. These are the two phosphorylation sites in this particular AAV8 serine peptides. So in this uh, peptide digest, uh, uh, protein digest, we have uh, observed uh, multiple uh, DM-mediated peptides. For example, uh, representative, we have given uh, these two peptides. One is, uh, uh, you can see, for this peptide, lowest is 0.9%, uh, and for this peptide, we could see 0.04% of the deamidation. Okay. These are the MSMS confirmation for the exact site of modification. As I mentioned earlier, uh, EAD would generate the diagnostic fragments for uh, differentiation of isomers. Uh, to Just to showcase one of the example here, uh, if it is isoaspartic acid, theoretically, EAD generate uh, the fragments C plus 57, C minus 57 as a diagnostic. If we see these fragments in the spectrum, MSMS spectrum, we can confirm that particular uh, modification is isoaspartic acid. It's not aspartic acid. It's very important, like if you if you do the ex extraction of this particular modified peptide, you, we will be able to see the peaks at XAC of different retention times, right? This is native and this is a, <clears throat> deamidated, deamidated, deamidated. So these are uh, just copied and uh, put together. That's why you are you are missing. Uh, we are we are missing some baseline here. So these are not from the same excesses. These are from different excesses, just copied and pasted here. So if you compare the CAD MSMS spectrum of uh, these three different uh, modifications or same modification at different retention times, we will not be able to differentiate anything. CAD will generate same MSMS spectrum for all these three modifications. So if you take a closer look at the EAD MSMS spectrum of all these three mod, uh, three modification XICs, you can see uh, at 27.4 minutes, this is Z5, Z5 means one, two, three, four, five. This side uh, uh, is Z fragment, from this side it is C fragment. So Z5 plus 57, 
z5 uh, z5 plus 1 minus 57 z minus 57 is the diagnostic fragment for confirmation of the isoaspartic acid so that we can say this is the isoaspartic acid and similarly uh, if you look at the uh, 28 minute uh, xic msms so there is no diagnostic fragment in the ead spectrum so that we can attribute this as a aspartic acid similarly uh, the third uh, xcc of 30.1 minute again we could confirm this as isoaspartic acid based on the diagnostic fragment that we are able to get from the eed fragmentation so this is all like here i simply uh, we wanted to demonstrate the uh, workflow uh, for um, peptide mapping uh, the with minimum uh, on column load uh, just to want to uh, i want to mention here we have uh, loaded 200 nanogram on column for uh, cad fragmentation data acquisition for ead fragmentation we have loaded 300 nanogram so to address the uh, the sample limitation volume so with this uh, sax zenot of 76 600 with a very low on column uh, load we could get very strong msms confirmation for low abundant modification modifications also for this particular uh, workflow for av8 it is very critical because uh, the one of the major challenge is sample limitation so with this workflow we will be able to determine the modifications at very low level as well thanks del we've got questions rolling in yep for the, for the last 20 minutes so i i love sure. to see everybody's engagement i've got lots of questions for you some juicy ones some quite easy ones so we'll, <laughs> we'll give you a, a mix of both <laughs> Um the first question is what is the advantage of using Xenotop 7600 for AAVs specifically peptide mapping Yeah as i just mentioned like the major limitation uh, for this AAV characterization is the uh, limited sample availability So here we have uh, demonstrated that uh, with very limited uh, on column load we just loaded 200 nanogram that that is with the analytical flow not not the micro or nano flow we could get the very good uh, uh, sequence coverage it's 94.7% and also we could see uh, confirmation msms confirmation for uh, all the peptides that we have identified okay so and while we're one. just while we're talking about the method i had a question here about uh flow rate and which column so if you could just remind us a little bit about your your chromatography specs please yeah for for uh, peptide mapping also we have used same formic acid buffer system and column we have used it's uh, like c8 in column csh c8 in column okay yeah perfect all right let's see what else um we'll, we'll keep it on on method specs it looks like we use the same collision gas 7 and energy 10 for both intact and peptide mapping methods can you explain why yeah so what, the collision energy what you see at uh, the top ms level is not for the fragmentation that is a minimum collision energy that is required for transmitting the ions so the top ms you might have seen uh, for just transferring the ions not for the fragmentation maybe if you want i can just quickly share the ms uh, method give me sure. a second yeah okay for example the ce what you are seeing here is a top ms level this is the minimum ce that is required for uh, efficient transfer of ions from the quadrupole 1 to quadrupole 2 and then quadrupole 2 to the uh, top uh, top tube so this is not for the fragmentation this this will be same for both peptides or intact mass right so when it comes to the peptide mapping we will apply the dynamic ce for fragmentation so based th there is a script in the uh, background automatically this uh, collision energy will be calculated based on the size of the peptide right so this will be the ce for the actual fragmentation you might have confused looking at this this ce and this ce this is the value generally required for the fragmentation okay right and delop while you're still sharing your screen if you could go back to your last slide where we were looking at the isomerization um did we have any presence of c plus 57 C plus fifty seven no because predominantly we will get the Z fragments like similarly when you when you when you do the when you do the uh, C A D fragmentation mostly we will get the Y fragments right dominant dominant Y fragments.
so in this case also we got the z fragments as a like more abundance okay and i'll make mention too that it's not only c and z ions that we are producing with ead depending on yep. what energy level you're using we can also identify b and y a yeah, right. and yeah. what letter am i missing x uh AB, so we, yeah. depending on how much energy you're using energy we'll, also, you we'll see we'll see more than just c c and z um let's see um oh this one so I actually I'm going to uh give you kind of a softball here I'm going to share my screen because this question is can you explain once more the difference between CID and EAD so I have taken the liberty of pulling up a slide um for you just to to help you explain it a little bit can you see my slide Okay, cool. All right, Dilip, why don't you go ahead and explain what, what EAD is and why it's different than CID. Yeah, EAD is like electron activated dissociation, right? So uh, electron, uh, we will generate the electron filament based electron generation. That electron will interact with the precursor that we, are, we want to fragment. Then it will generate the uh, C and Z uh, based on the different values that we are using on the kinetic energy that will generate different fragmentation. So what it the basically the difference is when you use electron based fragmentation it's a kind of soft soft fragmentation so when you want to characterize or localize uh, localize the label modification like glycopeptides or uh, sulfopeptides or phosphopeptides when you when you when you fragment those peptides with the cad fragmentation so cad fragmentation will fragment all the fragile glycan fragments so we don't get any confirmation confirmation about the backbone peptide that is connected with the glycan because that will break uh, that will fall fall apart when we use the cad fragmentation when you when you use the ead fragmentation which is a softer fragmentation so we will get the glycan fragment for example glycan fragment intact intact glycan that is connected to the peptide so that we will be able to identify the exact site of modification which is not possible with the CAD fragmentation. So and also, as the uh, as I mentioned, like uh, in this uh, 7600 system, we can uh, we can adjust the kinetic energy of the electron that is being introduced into the reaction chamber, where the, actually this electron will react with the precursor for the fragmentation. So if we use a zero to five fragmentation, it is a uh, more beneficial for multiply charged peptides or proteins. So generally, zero to five, we can use it for uh, middle down, middle down uh, workflow. Like uh, intact proteins can be fragmented because they are very multiply charged, highly charged species. When you when you increase the energy from five to ten, that is called hot ECD or EAD, right? Electron capture dissociation. This is the value very critical for this particular AAV8 characterization because we are characterizing the phosphopeptides and uh, aspartic acid uh, differentiation, all those stuff will be useful. Like amino acid isomer differentiation, glycopeptides, disulfide bonded peptides, all those information we can get when we use the electron energy around five to 10, right? If you increase further the electron energy, you can go to, uh, the, this will allow you to fragment singly charged uh, molecules also, which is not possible with any other vendor, uh, ETD or EAD fragmentation. This is one of the unique nature in the 7600 system where user have the capability to adjust the electron energy. So the, uh, to answer the question, the major difference is between the CAD and EAD, you will be able to get the intact modification connected with the peptide, which is not possible with the CAD fragmentation because they are uh, they they break the fragile molecules. So I, I I'm gonna bounce off of that a little bit, Dil. An analogy that I like to use with CID and EAD is CID is kind of dropping a glass vase off of a 20 story building. When it drops, it's gonna shatter. There's no way you can glue those pieces back together because the pieces are going to be so small. So you're missing a lot of that information. Whereas EAD, since it's softer, it's like dropping a vase out of my hand, just sitting here. It's going to break into larger pieces 
And if I wanted to, I can glue those pieces back together. And I'm, I'm seeing more of that information that I started with, just as you would with your protein or your peptide. So that's kind of the, the softer fragmentation analogy in a, in a real life example. Uh, let's see, lots of, lots of good questions. Um, when is isomerization characterization important? Yeah, when you see like, when you get the deamidation uh, in the sample, you don't know like uh, whether it is isospectic acid or isospectic acid. So in that case, you can get a uh, confirmation by using a EAD diagnostic fragment. And also like uh, uh, another is like uh, vari variants, uh, uh, sequence variants. Sequence variants also one of the most important uh, uh, workflow. We can use this uh, diagnostic uh, fragments that can be confirmed uh, whether it is a leucine or isoleucine. Just if you take example of leucine and isoleucine, in case of uh, sequence variation, if you just replace the leucine with isoleucine, CAD cannot differentiate. EAD will get the exact uh, confirmation whether it is leucine or isoleucine. Sequence yeah, variants also it's very critical. Yeah. Right. And it, it basically is important because depending on the amino acids that that is there or the shape of the isomer, it can change the shape of the protein, which could have um, epitope effects. It might have binding efficiency effects. It could have uh, implications of, of deamidation. So depending on which isomers are present, stability, efficiency, uh, immunogenicity, it can have lots of different side effects for the actual therapeutic itself, rather than even just the, the characterization of the molecule. Um, let's see, I feel like I'm badgering you with, with questions, Dilip. Let's, no, no, let's no. do maybe just a couple more. Yeah, um, yeah, are these workflows GXP compliant? The workflows I think in Biologics Explorer. Uh, GX, it's about like biologics. GLP or GLP. GMP, are they are they safe to use or compliant in those fashions? SIAX OS is definitely compliant software. Biologics Explorer uh, at this point, no. Uh, maybe once you once you uh, set all the parameters, maybe you may have to validate on your own, like with this uh, with the optimized parameters. Once you validate it, I think it can be used. Uh, it's not certified as like a GLP or uh, compliant software. Okay. All right, I did. I'm just remembering now I had one final poll that I wanted to to ask of the audience since you've had an opportunity to ask us many questions. I do want one more opportunity to ask a question of you. So we'll sit, we'll share this poll, leave it up for a minute, and I'll ask maybe two or three more questions of you, Dilip, um, while I've got you here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just confirming EAD can be used to differentiate D and ISO D peptides. Yes, we can differentiate them. Apart from that, we can differentiate leucine and isoleucine also. Perfect. Okay. Um, and in the example of Z plus ion intensity from EAD, is that typically higher than the Y plus intensity generated from CID? No, EAD fragments slightly low intensity than CID. Yep. And yeah. I'll actually, so that's, that's a very worthy question because it, it's worth a call out. Um, the intensity or the CPS of EAD fragments is often much lower than what you're used to seeing in CID, and that's because the background is so significantly lower. So what you're used to seeing in CID is just background noise is actually real peaks that are generated with EAD. So we might see 20, 30, 40, 50 counts, um, but those are real. real. They have been fragmented. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think maybe we can call it for now.